When buying a new graphics card, you have certain choices of which brand and model to pick up of that particular GPU. Though I know that's not exactly the easiest decision to make right now with stock and pricing being well, a slight issue. But cards have been available, are still available, and will get better in the near future. So it's always good to arm yourself with the relevant information on various models so that when the time comes, you can make the right choice. Which leads me on to today's review of the Zotac RTX 5080 Amp Extreme Infinity. A card that they claim is, well, a completely revamped experience and new approach to graphics card design. But what does that mean for you, the end user? Well, that's what we're gonna find out. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Oi oi, I hear you're in the market for a proper top of the line monitor. Best blacks, brightest whites, sharper than a tailor's crease, am I right? Yeah, that's the one. Well, look no further, my son. Feast your peepers on this, the Glaremaster 5000. A true marvel of technology. Just uh, maybe don't use it when the sun's out. What? That's not what I want. I was after a 32-inch 4K 165Hz QD OLED with adaptive sync. Cool, blimey. We've got a right tech connoisseur here. You don't mess about, do you? All right, all right. I see where you're coming from. Forget the Glare Master, that was just a warm up. What you need, my friend, is the Agon Pro, AG326UD from AOC. Top tier gear, 4K, 165 hertz, QD OLED, all the bells and whistles. And get this, HDR 400 certified. That's the real deal, no mucking about. Hmm, that does sound good. Of course it does. I wouldn't steer you wrong, would I? I'm all about quality, me. Now, if you want to get your hands on one of these beauties, you know what to do. To find out more, click the link in the description below. You won't regret it, my son. Lovely jubbly. Now, as with any factory overclock model, you'd expect some level of increased performance, and the Zotac RTX 5080 Amp Extreme Infinity does just that, at least in theory, featuring a boost clock of 2670 MHz, which is slightly higher than Nvidia's reference spec of 2617, but is only actually around a 2% increase. And while that may not sound like a game changer, it's always interesting to see how much extra performance, if any, that actually translates to in a real world scenario. However, what truly sets this card apart isn't just the clock speed, but the overall design and cooling solution that Zotac has opted for. Now, the Amp Extreme Infinity features their latest Ice Storm 3.0 cooling system, which consists of a triple fan setup with three good sized fans. These blade link fans aim to reduce turbulence and enhance airflow efficiency thanks to their design. Now, the idea here is to push more air across the massive heatsink while keeping noise levels down. And as always, we're going to be putting that to the test. Now, speaking of cooling, the card features a vapor chamber design with an extended aluminium fin stack heatsink with copper heat pipes that make direct contact with the GPU die, ensuring efficient heat dissipation. The 34% larger size compared to previous models should, in theory, help maintain lower temperatures even under extended gaming or workload scenarios, and now spans the whole of the card, end to end. Additionally, the Amp Extreme Infinity includes a die-cast metal backplate, which not only adds to the card's structural rigidity, but also acts as a passive heatsink, helping to dissipate some of the heat away from the GPU and VRMs. Now, in terms of the size, this is a big card, but in fairness, all 5080s are, with the exception of the Founders model, which is slimmer, but still large. Now, the Zotac card measures in at 332 millimeters in length, 137 millimeters in height, and 69 millimeters thick. And that puts it as a 3.5 slot design, meaning that while it's not quite as chunky as some of the highest end RTX 5090 models, it's still one of the larger RTX 50 series cards on the market. This means case compatibility will be something to consider, especially if you're working with a more compact build. But truthfully, if you're looking at getting any RTX 5080, I'm sure you're taking all of that into consideration anyway. It does also come in weight-wise at 2.48 kilo. So again, it's on the upper end of the scale, but again, nothing really out of the ordinary. Now, one of the standout features of this model is Zotac Spectra 2.0 RGB lighting, which spans across the side, end, and back of the card, giving it a bold and aggressive look. Unlike other more subdued designs like the Founders from Nvidia or the Tough from Asus that we've looked at recently, the Amp Extreme Infinity leans heavily into the aesthetics, making it a great choice for those who want their build to stand out. Because well, whether you have this vertically or horizontally, it's definitely going to do that. And I feel that with the huge popularity of fish tank style cases, that the Infinity Mirror definitely kind of helps the card stand out from the competition. 
Of course, as you'd expect, the RGB is fully customizable via Zotac's Firestorm software, allowing you to tweak colors, effects, and sync lighting with other components inside your case. Now, for those who like to have a bit more control over their cooling and performance, the card also includes a dual BIOS button, offering the choice between an amplify mode, which pushes the fans harder for lower temperatures, and a quiet mode, which prioritizes reduced noise levels at the expense of slightly higher temperatures. This is a feature that we've seen on many premium AIB models, but they'd normally include different clock speeds too. While on the Zotac card, it's, well, purely a fan speed button, and it, well, just works slightly differently to other cards. While other cards have a switch that you can change and then boot the card up, the Zotac card actually requires the card to be powered on, then press the button and wait for the red light to indicate the performance BIOS or the blue light for the quiet mode, and then restart your machine. In my opinion, it's just, it's a bit clunky compared to the competition, and I just feel that maybe a better implementation could have been done. Now, power-wise, the RTX 5080 Amp Extreme Infinity sticks to NVIDIA's 12 volt 2x6 connector, but it does have a safety light on there. And this is obviously capable of delivering up to 360 watts to the GPU. Now, given that this is a factory overclock model, you can expect power draw to push towards the upper end of that limit. And Zotac actually recommend an 850 watt PSU as a minimum. Though as always, if you're running a high-end CPU alongside this card, a thousand watt unit or so would actually be a safer bet. So where does the Zotac Amp Extreme Infinity sit in the market? Well, with its robust cooling, aggressive aesthetics, and factory overclock, it's positioned as one of the more, let's say, premium RTX 5080 options available. But with that, well, comes a price premium of $1,349. And as always, the question kind of remains, does the added cooling and design justify that extra cost? Well, that's what we're going to be putting to the test in our benchmarks. But first, we wanted to see what was capable in terms of overclocking. What we were able to achieve was a 250 megahertz overclock on the GPU's core clock and a 1000 megahertz increase on the memory. This now brings the boost clock up to 2920 megahertz and the memory now up to 2000. So a subtle increase of just over 9%, which I guess is nice to see, but is lower than what we've seen on other cards from rival brands. Now to get an idea as to what this overclock, the amplify mode and the quiet mode mean for cooling, we booted up F124 for an hour long loop to see what levels of performance we get in terms of temperatures, fan speed and power usage, along with looking at the all important clock speed behavior. What we find is that amplify mode does push things a little harder and we end up seeing the GPU temperature two degrees lower than what we saw in the quiet mode with 63 degrees on average as opposed to 65. Both of these do fall just under the Founders Edition's temperatures, but with this only being by one degree when compared to the quiet mode, it really could be argued as margin of error. We also see that the overclock doesn't change a whole lot, and when we consider that we were using the Amplify preset when overclocking in hopes of getting some better results, we see that the temperature only increases by one degree, to 66 on average, so really nothing to complain about. Memory junction temperatures don't really tell much of a story at all since the Founders Edition, Zotac's Quiet Mode and the Overclock all fall into the same 66 degree average, with the only outlier being the Amplify Mode, which sits two degrees lower than everything else at 64 degrees. In terms of the fan speeds, we can see why things are pretty close as everything falls in line, with the Founders Edition and Amplify Mode generally falling around 10 RPM of each other. And as a result, they both sound pretty similar, which is already hard to notice amongst the rest of the system. So the mere 150-ish RPM drop that we see from changing to quiet mode seems just overall a little pointless, since you can't actually hear a difference and we see pretty much no change to temperatures. The overclock interestingly reduced the fan speed down to around the same level that we see from the quiet mode, which doesn't really make sense to me, especially since we triple checked that we were in the amplify mode when overclocking. So what happened here is, well, anyone's guess, not that it seemed to make a huge difference to temperatures anyway. Power is another weird one, as if we look at averages, we can see that there is a small but steady increase as we move through each test, starting with the Founders Edition that ran at around 320 watts of power throughout the run, which then went up to around 325 watts when we compared to Zotac in the Amplify mode. But weirdly, enabling the Quiet mode actually brings the power draw up again to around 330 watts. Then when we look at the overclock, we can see that the power draw increases again to an average of around 340 watts. Then as we look at the clock speed, we can see that the Zotac increases the base clock that we saw on the Founders Edition by around 120 megahertz on average, which stays pretty consistent with the quiet mode too. 
Overclocking did allow us to up the core and the boost clock up by 250 megahertz on the core, which does translate pretty well to the real world clock. And then in terms of the memory, we were only able to actually see a 1000 megahertz increase over stock when we overclocked the card. So don't expect this to make a huge difference to performance overall, and any further due to GDDR7 having ECC can actually cause performance to drop. Looking at some gaming performance and starting with a Plague Tale, and we see that the Zotac does provide a bit of a boost over the Founders Edition, with 5% more frames on average and 7% more in the lows. This isn't quite enough to match the performance increase that we saw from the Azus Tough Guard though, as that sits 4% ahead of the Zotac in the averages, but only 1 FPS in the lows. Interestingly, when we overclock the GPU, we actually see a decrease in performance, though not in the averages, as they remained identical, but we now see a 6% decrease in performance in the lows, showing that our overclock is putting some limits on us in places. Moving on to Black Myth Wukong, and here we see the Zotac card only just ahead of the Founders Edition, with a single frame more in the averages and an identical low result. This also happens to fall just a single FPS behind the tough in the averages, but falls 2 FPS behind in the lows, so not really much in it. What is nice to see here though is that when we try overclocking we actually see a decent performance uplift with 5% more performance on average and 8% more in the lows when compared to how the card runs at stock. And this increase now places the Zotac 4% higher than the tough in both the averages and those all important lows. The next game in the list is Cyberpunk 2077 where we see the Zotac making a decent 8% improvement in frame rate over the Founders Edition card, now matching performance with the RTX 4090 but with 4% more FPS in the lows as a kind of cherry on top. Whilst this improvement is welcomed, it's still not quite enough to match the tough card which sits another frame ahead in the averages, just beating the 4090. But what we also see here is a much better 1% low figure, with it sitting 12% ahead of the amp extreme. Overclocking doesn't do anything to help improve things here, and instead reduces our average frame rate by 1 FPS, making it, well, kind of pointless. Next up is Indiana Jones with 4% more frames on average when compared to the founders, so there really isn't too much to complain about. We are still just barely behind the tough card here though, with only 1 FPS less in the averages, and the lows fare worse with the Zotac, falling 12% behind. What is particularly impressive though is our overclocking result, when we compare how the card performed before and after, and we can see that it's gained 7% more frames on average, and 8% more in the lows. Despite this improvement being enough to have the Zotac ahead of the tough by 6% in the averages, it's still not enough to compete with the low result that the tough saw, and the overclocked Zotac still falls behind, but this time by 5%. Starfield is next and here we see some better placements but not much in the way of performance increases. The Amp Extreme does manage 5% ahead of the Founders Edition and 1 FPS ahead of the Tough Card, still with worse lows though. But what is interesting in this game is that the overclock was able to give us an extra frame in the averages but has seriously affected the lows, where we actually see a 27% drop in performance, bringing us below the 60 FPS mark. What we found was that this result was consistent even after retests, so whilst we do enjoy a very slight improvement in the averages, it doesn't seem worth it when the game just feels so much worse. Looping back around to Black Myth Wukong, but this time with ray tracing enabled, and here we see that the Founders Edition, the Tough, and the Zotac card all have the same average frame rate, with the Tough and Zotac both sitting 1 FPS higher than the Founders Edition in the lows, so nothing really of significance. Overclocking does again give us some better frame rates, with us now seeing 6% more performance when compared to the rest of the cards, but again, we do see a decrease when it comes to the lows, though only by a negligible 1 FPS this time, making it tie with the Founders Edition card. Though, that all being said, at around 30 FPS, you'll want to harness the benefits of upscaling to play this game on these settings anyway. Finally is Cyberpunk again, but now with ray tracing enabled, and here we see a very similar story to Black Myth, but a little more tame. What we see is that the Tough and Zotac both sit just a single frame ahead of the Founders card in both the averages and the lows, whilst the Overclock was able to gain us another frame in the averages, but saw no difference to the lows. Now, I'd prefer no difference to a decrease though, so this result isn't too bad, though it does still fall under margin of error. And again, this is a game that needs upscaling, and luckily enough, Cyberpunk supports all forms of upscaling, including multi-frame generation. So in terms of performance, the RTX 5080 Amp Extreme Infinity offers some measurable gains over the Founders Edition in certain titles, but much like other AIB models, these improvements are often marginal. The 5% uplift in A Plague Tale and the stronger 1% lows in Black Myth Wukong when overclocked are noteworthy, but across the majority of games, the difference is within a small margin, and in some cases, overclocking actually resulted in performance losses, especially in the 1% lows. 
This suggests that the constraints of the 50 series and its early driver optimizations are still a factor. As we saw, similar inconsistencies with the Tough model from Asus and the FE model from NVIDIA. And this, I guess, always makes it harder for AIBs to make a product that warrants buying over what's already been made possible at MSRP. So most of the time, well, you're paying for more looks and cooling potential. Now, one of the biggest talking points with the Amp Extreme Infinity is its cooling solution. The Ice Storm 3.0 cooler does a solid job, keeping temperatures under control with its vapor chamber technology and large heatsink array. The card runs cooler than the Founders Edition in most scenarios, and while the Amplify mode does drop temps slightly, the Quiet mode doesn't significantly impact performance either. The fan profiles feel well, well tuned and noise levels do remain reasonable, though the implementation of that BIOS switch requiring a restart is a bit clunky compared to other brands. So I definitely mark things down because of that. Power consumption, I guess, is another aspect worth mentioning. While the Zotac draws slightly more power than the Founders Edition, it's not an alarming increase, though the odd behavior in quiet mode drawing more than the Amplify mode is, I guess, a bit of a head scratcher. Overclocking pushed things up to around 340 watts, which is still within expectations for a high-end AIB model. Though again, I don't really see much benefit to overclocking this card as, well, I guess we've already shown, the juice isn't really worth the squeeze. Now, the main thing I guess is going to set this apart from other cards, and we have to talk about it, the value. The um, $1,349 price tag puts it firmly in premium territory. And while the design, cooling, and factory overclock add some appeal, it's genuinely hard to justify the near 35% markup over MSRP. Though, I guess if you're already spending that money, then, well, yeah, there's other cards on the market that offer similar levels of cooling and performance for the same price. Although I do fear, with the lack of stock on these cards, it's really going to come down to what you can get at the time. And while the Zotac card is... Well, it's nice, it's lovely. You're paying heavily for aesthetics and cooling rather than kind of outright gaming advantages. And well, that's not a fault of Zotac. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. At the end of the day, the Amp Extreme Infinity is a good card, but much like we saw with the Azus Tough, Nvidia's Founders Edition is becoming increasingly difficult to beat in terms of value. The price premium on AIB cards, it, well, it's going to continue to grow, making it harder to recommend unless you're specifically drawn to design, RGB lighting, or slight cooling improvements. If, and it's a big if, if this was kind of priced closer to say $1,200, it would make for a more compelling option. But as it stands, you'd likely get more enjoyment from pairing an MSRP 5080, which Zotac do have, with a CPU upgrade, like a 7800X3D or 9800X3D or similar, rather than just spending the extra cash on marginal GPU gains. So yeah. That's going to wrap this one up, the review of the Zotac RTX 5080 Amp Extreme Infinity. If you enjoyed the video, a like and a sub would be greatly appreciated. And if you want some cool behind the scenes content, exclusive game nights and early access to what we're working on, check out our Patreon. The link is as always down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. To infinity and beyond.